Um, yeah, so it's Emmanuel Savanda from the Gradient Boost. Um, the Gradient Boost is an online mentor guided data science school for the African continent. Um, you can read more about the structure of the bootcamp on our site at thegradientboost.com. We're launching into the data science course commencing on the 18th of May. The course has introductory modules on Python, SQL, stats, data visualization, linear algebra, machine learning. Try to keep things as practical as possible to give you, while well, giving you enough theory to start practicing concepts on your own as quickly as possible. Um, today we're showcasing one of our mentors on the Gradient Boost. His name is Robert Sonic. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, that's cool. correct. Data scientist at uh, Thoratec Simulation. So Robert, how, how are you doing today? Good yourself. Very good, thanks. It's a bit cliche, but how's the lockdown in the new normal? How are you, how are you surviving with this current? Um, you know what? I'm actually a little bit more productive than I would be at the office because uh, there are less meetings and you have more quiet time. So you can actually, you know, do some proper deep work, get some real concentration going. So it's, it's pretty productive. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So what is your journey to become a data scientist like? How did you become a data scientist? How did you find out about the field and transition to that career? Um, okay, I was for most of my, um, well, I was a professional student before I became a data scientist, data analyst. Um, so I studied all the way up to a PhD in space physics and close to the end, I was wondering if I should keep on pursuing uh, an academic career or maybe move to, um, to the private sector. And, um, one of the strong skills that you learn in, um, my PhD is in space physics or astrophysics, um, uh, which is a more general, uh, general name for it. And one of the skills that you learn, except for not just the um, mathematical, hard mathematical and data analytics and data interpretation skills, is also programming. You, you get quite strong in that, especially um, with, with a research group at Northwest University from where I am, or where I initially um, started undergrad and worked all my way up to a PhD. I've got a very, very strong um, computational uh, background. So a lot of um, simulations, a lot of numerical um, applications, very, very good, strong group. So um, working there, I developed a strong develop, um, programming skill set um, in Python. I taught myself and um, wrote a small data pipeline, which I um, did optical image um, reduction and um, processing. So my studies was main in optical astronomy. So I went up to Sutherland numerous times. I think I was there about 12 times. I worked on um, almost all of the telescopes. They, well, <laughs> constantly new ones popping up. But um, fun. Uh, so um, I worked with a little bit of salt data and some of the smaller one meter and 1.9 meter telescopes. And um, all of that image processing and production was done in Python. And, um, you know, having this skill set together with my data analytics skills, I was wondering if maybe I could apply this in, in, in industry because um, academia is a very, very competitive market to get into. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's about 2% of PhDs actually get an academic career, you know, a permanent position. And it's, it's a very demanding job. So um, private sector also offers you a little bit more of job, job security. So, um, about two years before ending my, my PhD, I was actually um, realizing that there was this new field emerging, data science, which is mainly based on um, giving companies insight into data sets that they have collected over many years. So it's, it's a quantitative analysis of, of um, many things. So for example, sales data, um, some telemetric data, um, Many businesses don't, didn't necessarily have the hard skills to actually make profit out of it. And um, as, as, a, as a few quotes go, the data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century and um, data is the new oil. Um, you can see a very, very strong growth from companies such as Google and some of these other internet um, companies. And you know, the term data science was actually termed by one of the founders in, at LinkedIn where, where they had very, very good um, usage of the data on their websites, you know, generating the timeline, um, 
on, on your browse, browser when you open up LinkedIn, setting the priorities and the, you know, the, the levels in, at which they, the order in which, which the content is displayed. That's a lot of brain power that goes into it. And um, you know, I gave data science a, a bit of a try and um, it's worked out for me so well, so up to now. So I'm very happy uh, currently where I am. It's not just data science that I'm doing. I'm also doing a bit of SQL development and a little bit of Angular at this stage, teaching myself TypeScript. So it's moving more towards a actual, you know, full stack developer. But um, data science and analytics is the real main focus. You know, um, we're really in a good time now. We're we're not just moving into data science, but um, data science will be called decision science. Um, I've already seen that name a few times now. And also, you know, the traditional role of a data scientist is not, will not always be there. We're moving more into a matured phase now. You know, data science has been around for about 12 years now, and then you're getting more people focused just on machine learning. So you've got machine learning engineers going on, and you've got data engineers setting up um, pipelines just for, you know, cleaning up data, or, you know, setting up um, Spark systems, Spark clusters, um, getting the data in the right format so that your machine learning engineers or your data scientists can do their predictive models and actually put those into production. You know, there's, there's a lot of roles that are, um, you know, it's, it's almost uh, evolving in the field. Um, you know, it's very highly paced. Um, you have to really, keep on skill, upskilling yourself. Even if you're per, in a permanent position, you have to constantly teach yourself new things. Um, so, and also data science has evolved out of open source. Um, you know, a lot of free software is where the real magic is happening, stuff like Python and all, is everything open source. You know, you, you, if you have a basic machine, basic laptop, you can install most of the software for free. You just need a lot of data and a lot of um, unlimited internet access. So, but uh, and there's also so many resources online to teach yourself these skills. You know, it's it's constantly um, getting you know better. So it's a good time to be in data science. So there are two like uh, two main views: the view that you should study something that's um, math or science heavy to get into data science, and there's a view that you can learn things on your own and kind of work on projects that will highlight the skills you're gaining and become a data scientist through, through that route. Like where do you stand in that debate? Um, I'm more an academic. Uh, I think you must have the mathematical background, um, statistical math background, because anyone can really, um, you know, install a package and apply it on data. But what happens when uh, when you've got a deadline and the model that you're developing isn't performing the same as the tutorials that you did on your small projects that you did with your training. So um, I would say you must have at least second year calculus. Um, you must have at least um, some good statistical uh, interference training. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of background and a lot of mathematics that goes into just applying these skills. Um, in maybe four or five years' time, something that's going to be more main, mainstream is quantum machine learning. Uh, it will be machine learning that's done on quantum computers. It's, it's um, maybe a year or two ago, it started to grow and it's, it's building up quite strongly. If, if you look at the IBM research group in Zurich, uh, they've, they've really pushed you now one, no, one or two people um, that's, that has worked there. When, one lady did, did an internship there and um, it's actually quite impressive. So that's, you know, data science as we know it is already called classical data science and quantum data, quantum machine learning is now the next big thing. Um, but that will only be in two or three years time if it actually picks up, you know, that's also still a big question if we actually get there. Yeah. So what's a typical day like at work? Is it a typical day at all? Or is it just a mixture of new projects all the time? Like what's a typical day look like exactly? Okay, well, um, I'm usually an early starter, so the current company that I'm currently at has flexi time, so that's very nice. Um, you come in, I usually start at 6.30, um, and I come in, um, get my morning coffee, go through a few emails, maybe read one or two um, articles from, from towards data science or code project. 
um, then I start looking at our Jira board. Uh, it's usually, you know, most software teams of four or five guys working in an agile environment. So you have a Jira board with uh, tasks. Um, they, they are split up according to a certain amount of time that each task should be done, doing or should take to be done. Um, the first three hours of each morning is the most productive for me. So from 6.30 up to 9.30, I'm very productive. At 9.30, we've got a small scrum. I stand up for about half an hour. Um, I've got a very good database wizard, a um, little bit of an older gentleman, but very good mentor at this stage. Um, so working a lot with him, he's got a lot of um, experience with uh, analytic systems, building up big things for power, power supply companies and so on. So I do a lot of collaboration in this duo uh, in our team, but um, usually push through from the stand up up to lunch time, then um, take about an hour's lunch. Uh, sometimes you work through lunch, depends on how, how, work, how much work you have for the day, and then push up up to 4 o'clock, 4.30. So then maybe at the gym after that. So yeah, that's the typical day for me. Sounds cool. So is this, um, this view that you transition from software engineering to data science a lot easier than you would from any other career? What, what's your perspective on that particular view? Look, if you are a good developer, um, Data science or machine learning is just another skill that you can learn. Um, if you are if you're a programmer, then you're already quite good with, with math, um, logical thinking. So you'll pick it up quite easily. The, the big thing is the stats. Um, a lot of machine learning is just good application of stats. Um, you know, the theory has been there. Neural networks have been around since I think the 1970s. I'm not really not sure about the history there. Um, I'm a bit tired, it was, it's been a long week. So I think it's about 30, 40 years that, that the mathematical theory has been around. It's only now that we've got the strong enough computing power with um, large clusters and GPUs that we actually can apply the, uh, the techniques with brute force um, applications. So if you know, look, look at deep learning, um, it's, it's a very strong computational brute force solution for the most optical um, or yeah, option, I mean, the most optimal um, solution for, for the problem that you want to solve. And um, you can efficiently and quite um, quickly get, get an answer to, is the model that I'm currently applying, let's say, um, a decision tree against, uh, you know, an unstructured um, machine learning solution, how are they, comparing up against each other. So you can, um, especially with the cloud, you know, if you look at Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio, um, they're very smart with that. They can, you can test a number of 10 or 12 different models running through one data set. And um, it's, it's a little bit cookie cutter solution, but um, you know, it's, you can very easily solve, solve those um, things very quickly. So if you are a good programmer, you've got, 80% of the skills. It's about building up that theoretical um, background. That's the big thing. Um, the stats is so important. Mm. Um, anyone can actually apply the skills, but if you actually really want to understand how it works, um, which is a very good trademark of a good engineer, of statist statistician, you have to have that theoretical background. And that's where I'm coming back, coming from again. On the academic side, you you need to understand what you're working with. Otherwise, you know it's you can use a, or build up a, a model, but it's not to say that it will be reliable in the long term. You know there might be some small biases built into the model that you develop, and over three or six months, if that thing keeps on building on large sets, larger and larger and larger sets of data, it might fall over. So um, and you have to be able to maintain your models over the long term. You know, it's, it's not just about developing things, it's also maintaining things and, um, you know, fine tuning and tweaking those hyperparameters if, if you have to. Um, also depends on, you know, the, the accuracy that, that you want out of it. Um, it's also un really understanding things like a confusion matrix and so on. You really have to know what your measurements or your metrics tell you. 
So, um, so if you're a strong programmer, that's a very good place to start from, but you have to take it incrementally and you have to actually learn at your own pace. So um, don't compete against anyone else. If you want a tip from me, don't compete against anyone else, compete against yourself, you know, try to be a better programmer or data scientist each day after that. So um, that's my view on software developers trying to be data scientists. Makes a lot of sense. On a different note, um, COVID-19 and the lockdowns are wrecking economies worldwide. People are losing yeah. jobs, um, companies are closing down on a day-to-day -day basis. What do you think the demand for data scientists will look like in, in South Africa in general, like over, over, the next, over the immediate future, let's put it that way, the next um, few years? Look, the thing is, uh, South Africa is about four to five years behind the rest of the world, if you look at, for example, in the States. Um, that's my perception from, from the private sector, which I haven't been too long in the private sector and I haven't been in too many big meetings of, of big corporates. But, um, you know, there's, there's quite a big skills shortage in South Africa, but that's not just in data, terms of data science. If you look at software developers alone, you know, the market's quite open. Um, so I think uh, there's definitely opportunity there, but it's also... Uh, people having the capacity to be able to do the job, which is also a problem. Um, you know, yeah, I think if you attend one or two boot camps, then it's not necessarily enough to really secure a position. It depends on, on the company. If, if you're really bright and you can pick up things quite easily and, you know, one boot camp is enough to show you the ropes and you can start running Kaggle competitions and really making a success, it's, hey, if you can do it, then I say go for it. But uh, uh, it's it's getting more competitive. More people are trying to get into the field. So it's not what it was two or three years ago. It's it's getting really more competitive on a day to day basis, and it's more people. It comes down to your skill set. You have to constantly upskill yourself. Hmm. So um, I don't know if if you are in a fortunate enough position of being in the data industry and software development industry, um, I think you might have a have something post um, lockdown. But um, remember, it is it's a very fortunate position to be in. Uh, many people don't don't have that option to to work from from home and work remotely. You know, if you have your, you have a small business, then then it's it's very tough time now. And um, support your local businesses. Uh, you know, big chains uh, can afford it to go through these lockdowns but uh you know the small artisan bakery on the corner is the guy who really needs your support or post post lockdown so if you have a position as a data scientist you know go go for the local shops support the small guys that's that's very true that's very true As the last question what do you enjoy about mentoring new learners who are keen on learning data science like what which part of that like fascinates you the most of mentoring yeah. um Look, it's, it's wonderful for me to see that moment when, when someone has that aha feeling. You know, if somebody gets the goosebumps and they actually snap a concept, that's the real thing that's awesome for me about mentoring. So if, if you take two or three hours to explain something, that is, um, uh, everyone's different. Everyone has different backgrounds. Everyone has different capabilities and talents. You know, I'm not a very good artist and I can sure, surely not sing well. But um, if, if you have an individual and you spend a few hours with them and they really understand what you meant for them after an afternoon of careful explanation, you know, it's, it's quite satisfying to actually see that when that individual grows. So, you know, if, if, if you look at, you know, coming from an academic background, if you look at students, at the beginning of an academic year and at the middle of the year, which is the end of the first semester and the end of the second semester, some individuals grow extremely well. Um, otherwise, others struggle. And going through tough times um, is, is necessary. So, you know, um, still seas never make good sailors. You, yeah. know, you, you have to go through the storm. You have to go through the tough times. You have to go through those grinding nights which you look back at in which you do the growth. So that's seeing that um, those phases go, th um, people mature through those phases, 
that's very, very satisfying for me. So that's mm. being the cool thing about our meet. Yeah. Cool. As, as a last, last question, do you find that you, you also learn as like a mentor, when you're mentoring someone and explaining things to them that you already know, you learn more about your, what you're mentoring too. Do you find that like, that, that actually happens sometimes? Yes, um, many, many times. Um, also in, in, in my own career, if, if I actually have a problem and I go and explain it to a colleague, um, I understand it, I snap it within a few minutes or not that it happens every time. But remember, if, if you're thinking by yourself about a problem, you're sitting alone in your own corner and it's only one, um, you're maybe focusing on that problem and you're looking into that brick wall. If, if you run marathons, you hit the wall um, after a few Ks. And um, if you go to someone and you rethink about it, you are speaking it, you are hearing it, and you're thinking actively of it. So it's in three places that, that it's getting processed. So if you explain it to someone and they might guide you just along the logical steps on solving a solution, it is much better than actually just thinking about something else or, or, th or thinking about it by yourself. So. Um, so that's very good to work in groups. Uh, so yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for your time, Robert. Um, and enjoy your day and stay safe, I guess. So enjoy your weekend. You too. Right. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Weekend now. So uh, have a cold one. <laughs> cool. Cheers. Cheers, eh?